Yes, Greg, I think uh, quantum physics is the key to consciousness. You know, going back to the Greeks, there's been this controversy between whether the brain produces consciousness or some part of consciousness is out in the universe that we access. And quantum physics allows us to sort of bridge that gap and actually favors uh, being able to access parts of consciousness or the essential features of consciousness which are present in the universe by working through the brain. Well, it's not quite that simple. Um, there are basically two approaches to the so-called hard problem of consciousness, namely uh, the hard problem being why we have experience, why we have flavors, tastes, emotions, feelings, how we're different from robots or zombies, mm -hmm. uh, why we have an inner life. And the two approaches are basically emergence and some kind of fundamental approach. Emergence is the idea that conscious experience emerges at sort of a high level of complexity. The brain, like many other systems, being sort of a hierarchy, and if you get complex enough up that hierarchy, voila, some new property emerges, like, uh, like a, a, a storm, for example, a hurricane or a tornado is a pattern that emerges from simple elements, mm -hmm. gas molecules, air molecules, uh, working together to, to make a funnel cloud, for example, or the great red spot of Jupiter, or a candle flame is an emergent property, or the property of wetness from water is an emergent property. So many people think that consciousness emerges as a new novel property at a high level of complexity in this hierarchical system that we call the brain. The problem with that, I think, is that none of these other emergent phenomena are conscious. They don't have conscious experience. Moreover, there's no real prediction at what level of complexity consciousness might occur in the brain. And if that were the case, computers should be conscious already or should soon be. So for that reason, plus the fact that that would uh, take away any possibility of free will, it also wouldn't give us this property of binding, how we bind everything together into one sense of self or unity of consciousness, and how we transition from the pre-conscious or subconscious to consciousness itself. These problems, I think, suggest that there's something more to consciousness than being an emergent property of computation. The brain is more than a simple classical computer. Soon. Well, they will be within the next 20 years or so, and people make these predictions that when the brain reaches a certain level of computations equivalent to the brain, it should be conscious. But of course, then they'll hedge and say, well, no, it's not organized the same, they'll keep pushing the boundary back. But the first problem with that is that, that uh, AI people, artificial intelligence people who make these predictions, assume that the brain works uh, along the lines of a computer in that the neurons of the brain and their connections, the synapses, are the fundamental units. So for example, we have roughly uh, 10 billion neurons mm -hmm. with, which with 1,000 connections each or 10,000 switches to other neurons, which gives us about 10 to the 15th operations per second okay. uh, with each neuron operating as a fundamental unit. The problem with that is that each neuron is much, much more complex than a simple switch. For example, consider a simple, a single cell like a, a paramecium, a single cell organism. Mm -hmm. It swims around, it finds food, it learns. If you suck it into a capillary tube, it escapes. And if you do it again, it gets out quicker and quicker each time so it can learn, it can find mates, it has a sex life, it does all kinds of things. It doesn't have any synapses whatsoever. It's just one cell. And yet it's conscious. I'm not sure it's conscious or not. That's a little bit, okay. but it's certainly intelligent and it does complex things without any synapses. All right. So if a paramecium, one cell, can do all those things, why should we think that a neuron is just a simple on-off switch or that a synapse is just a simple on-off switch? The capacity of a neuron is much greater than that. If we go back to the paramecium, how does, how does it do that? It uses its internal structure, its cytoskeleton, the, what, what seems like the structural support, but, it, but which is also the, the nervous system within each cell, the, the cytoskeleton comprised of microtubules mainly, which are these hollow cylindrical polymers that, that are seemi seemingly perfectly designed to be information processing devices at the molecular level, a scale below that of neurons. They are the nervous system within each cell, the, ner the nervous system within each neuron, if you will. So these proteins, they're made of proteins, switch much faster than neurons. There's many, many more of them. Um, well, there's like um, 10 million within each cell, for example, switching in the nanosecond. So if we think of processing going down to that level, there's, enough pro there's as much processing in one neuron at that level as there is in the whole brain, according to these AI-type estimates. So if we think that, that information processing in the brain goes down to the level of the microtubules, for example, we've increased the information capacity uh, by, from somewhere 
from 10 to the 15th roughly to 10 to the 27th. All right, we're doubling. R almost well, we're squaring it, yeah. Exactly, okay. So <clears throat> that pushes the, the goal way farther for the AI people. The problem is that even if that were the case, even if we're doing 10 to the 27th operations per second, even if the microtubules are the fundamental uh, computers of consciousness, that still doesn't tell us why we have experience, why we have an inner life, why we have emotions, feeling what philosophers call qualia. Mm -hmm. That's just more reductionism, more, um, you know, more computation, but doesn't solve the problem, nor does it solve the other problems like binding, transition from pre-conscious process into consciousness, the problem of free will, and so forth. And actually, I worked on uh, the idea that microtubules inside neurons and other cells were information processors and uh, for, for almost 20 years, suggesting that to understand consciousness, to understand the brain, we needed to go inside each neuron to this level to consider all this information processing. And yet, people would say, okay, maybe you're right, so what? How does that solve uh, the hard problem, as it's now known, of consciousness? How do you explain conscious experience from just further reductionism? And I had to admit that they were right. Um, even if the capacity of the brain were, were squared, it still didn't tell us why we had consciousness. Because the same arguments against emergence that I mentioned before still held. So at that point, about 1990, I read a book by Roger Penrose, the uh, Oxford mathematical physicist, called The Emperor's New Mind. And The Emperor's New Mind was kind of a challenge to artificial intelligence, AI being kind of uh, the computer uh, industrial complex pushing the idea that larger and larger computers will, will attain consciousness. And Roger's book was based on the idea that, uh, that our minds, our conscious minds, do, do something that is beyond the realm of regular computation. He called it non-computable. And basically it was the idea that we do things that we know things other than through algorithms, other than through things that a computer can do. And he argue, it's through Gödel's theorem, and it's uh, mathematical and philosophical. And to be honest, I didn't really understand all those arguments. Um, but my gut level was that he was right. He argued that to explain consciousness, to explain how we can have this non-computability, which is really another word for free will, or along the lines of free will, or going in the direction of free will. Because if the brain is just a computer, everything is deterministic. We're just reaction, reacting to things in our environment. Completely in the same predictable. Way a computer is. Correct. Or you know, with, maybe with some randomness, but, right. but well, not yeah. certainly no free will. And uh, we would be, uh, as as the philo as the philosopher uh, Huxley said, merely helpless spectators. Mm -hmm. We would be epiphenomena, just along for the ride. We wouldn't be in control of anything. Mm -hmm. We would just be well, epiphenomena, just you know, going along with our our actions and you know, observing basically without really having a say in what was going on. We might think we did, but but it was an illusion. So Rogers idea was that the only thing in nature that can give us this non-computable element was a quantum mechanism, specifically a quantum gravity mechanism. And this seems so tangential to the idea of what's going on in the brain that most people really couldn't buy it. And um, it, it, it's, a, it's a difficult concept, but to me, intuitively, there was something, something to it. Because what he said was, well, he likened the brain to a quantum computer. And that brings us into the world of, of quantum theory, which is a very difficult subject. In fact, Richard Feynman once said that anyone who claims to understand quantum theory is either lying or crazy, <laughs> because it's so bizarre. For example, if you go down to the quantum realm, like small, like down, say, to the level of atoms, and it, it may be larger, but let's just talk about atoms, <coughs> subatomic particles, things are completely different than they are in our, our classical world, where, where things are firm and real and in one place, because at the quantum level, things can be in multiple places at the same time. Particles can be smeared out and act like waves. Things can be interconnected even over great distances. Uh, time is smeared out. Everything is kind of different at that level. The boundary between this quantum world and the classical world, the Newtonian world in which we live, is unclear. It's called, some people call it the collapse of the wave function because below that level, in the quantum world, things are governed by the quantum wave function. Above it, they're governed by Newtonian physics, mm -hmm. classical, that we can understand. So this boundary is very unclear. And it was exemplified, the problem, for example, of superposition, of things being in multiple states at once. So quantum superposition means that things are superposed in, in two or more different places or states at the mm -hmm. same time. <coughs> so Erwin Schrodinger in 1937, uh, one of the pioneers of quantum theory, 
came up with a thought experiment to demonstrate how bizarre and seemingly ridiculous this situation was. He said, we know that something small like a photon or an electron could be in superposition. If we send a photon through a half-silvered mirror with a 50% probability that it will go through and a 50% probability that it will be reflected, quantum theory tells us that the photon will actually both go through and not go through. So if we, if we have that photon, if it takes one path, say reflected, strike a vial of poison and there's a cat inside a box. Mm -hmm. Schrodinger said the quantum theory would predict that since the photon both went through and did not go through, the poison would both be released and not be released, and the cat would be both dead and alive. In other words, the quantum, uh, the, the quantum superposition would be amplified to apply to the cat. And there was nothing in quantum theory or in physics whatsoever that would preclude that possibility. The only thing that seemed to occur would be that if a uh, quantum superposition was observed by a conscious observer, then it would collapse to either dead or alive, one or zero, one or the other. And so Schrodinger said, well, the cat is both dead and alive until someone opens the box and looks at it. And this is called Schrodinger's cat. It's a, it's a famous, famous paradox. And to this day, it's still somewhat of a problem, although we don't think necessarily that you need a conscious observer to cause the collapse of the wave function, to cause the cat to choose one or the other. Uh, it may be that any interaction with the environment, any interaction with the outside world will cause the, the quantum system to reduce to one state or the other. But what about a system that remains isolated? What about a system, a quantum superposition that remains uh, isolated from the uh, environment, from the outside world? There's nothing that tells us what will happen to it, and it, it can grow and stay in superposition. And <laughs> this property of superposition, despite the fact that nobody really understands it very well, is used in quantum, com quantum computers, which were first proposed in the 1980s and are now being built and developed very rapidly. The basic idea in quantum computing is that, well, in a classical computer, you have bits, right? Mm -hmm. Bit states, one or zero. Mm -hmm. And they interact, and you can compute, and of course, computers are great and do all kinds of things. Now, in a quantum computer, the, the information can be in quantum superposition so that you can have, in addition to one or zero, you can have a quantum superposition of one and zero. These are called quantum bits or qubits. Okay. So the qubits in superposition can talk to each other by non-local entanglement. And while in this state can do incredibly efficient computation. And in fact, uh, Peter Shore in 1994 proved that uh, mathematically that if you could build a quantum computer, they would be able to solve certain problems much, much faster than conventional computers. One of these problems would be factoring large numbers into their primes, something that's very difficult for classical computers. That problem, factoring large numbers into their primes, is the basis for nearly all cryptography, bank codes, military codes mm -hmm. throughout the world. So when governments and industry realized this, people began pouring money into the building a quantum computer. So that because if somebody had it, all the codes would be obsolete. Mm -hmm. So the race was on. And now there, there are other applications too. But it seemed difficult at first because the problem with the quantum computer is these superpositions are very delicate. Any interaction with the outside world would, will disturb them, will cause them to decohere, to lose their coherence. And then uh, several people came up with the idea th uh, that you could actually build quantum error correction. You can build into the system an algorithm that will detect decoherence before it destroys the quantum system and correct it. So that seemed to help things along. But even so, most quantum, si quantum computers are being built at very low temperature to avoid thermal oscillations, okay. <clears throat> which makes it unlikely at first glance to occur in the brain because the brain is fairly warm. Nonetheless, Roger in his book suggested that somehow the brain performed quantum computation, that there were superpositions going on, and that this could solve the problem of non-computability and free will. And he suggested, for example, that there could be a superposition of a nerve firing and not firing, that the nerves, nerve firings with the qubits are quantum bits. I read this and uh, I thought, boy, he's really onto something here. This, I, at a gut level, I think this quantum gravity quantum com computing in the brain is a good idea, but I thought maybe uh, th the level of neurons firing and not firing might be too high a level. You know, maybe the microtubules that I've been studying for 20 years at the molecular level, at a much smaller level, were doing the type of quantum computation that he was looking for. Mm 
So I contacted him and we got together and uh, to make a long story short, we began working together to develop a model of how quantum computation could occur in the microtubules inside the neurons at a much smaller level, which would be much more uh, conducive to quantum mechanisms, quantum computation. And microtubules seem very well designed to be quantum computers. So uh, that's what we did. And, uh, but yet people would still say, well, what about the hard problem? How you can explain experience? So let me go back to the Greeks for a minute, because the Greeks said, or I forget which one actually, um, it might have been Democritus, who said that atoms uh, had elements of psychic, and psychic mental uh, value. Uh, the idea that, that there's something in nature that has the raw component of conscious experience. This, this uh, developed into a philosophy called panpsychism, where everything had consciousness, like this table had consciousness, uh, every little thing had consciousness, which, which is not quite, uh, which isn't really satisfying. And it evolved over the, over the centuries and, and millennia, actually, um, into uh, something called pan-experientialism, or pan-proto-psychism, if you will. And for example, a philosopher in the early 20th century, Alfred North Whitehead, came up with an idea that of, of pan-experientialism. It was, it was called that later. He basically said that consciousness was a sequence of events, discrete events, occurring in a wider field of proto-conscious experience. Now, a philosopher named Abner Shimoni said that maybe the o Whitehead's occasions of experience were quantum state reductions, like in a quantum computer. Mm -hmm. But what could be the wider field of proto-conscious experience? Well, let's go back to what superposition really is. As I mentioned, quantum computers, which are being built today, even as we speak, in various, various forms. Successfully? Uh, prototypes successfully, mm -hmm. and uh, they're making progress faster and faster. They're doing it in, you know, in I with ion traps, with uh, spin, with spin uh, polarization. Um, quantum dots, quantum wells, and even in silicon, with a, a certain way of constructing silicon. Um, we don't have a quantum computer on desktops yet, but uh, most people in the field are, after some pessimism, are now encouraged that uh, they will be developed. Prototypes do exist, and you can solve certain problems with, I think, eight qubits is the current limit. And uh, because they're so fast, you don't need a lot of qubits, but it looks pretty good. Well, there's two answers to that. One is that they use massive parallel parallelism. Because of the quantum superposition, you can be doing many, many, many computations, almost an infinite number of computations simultaneously, so that you can sort of average out any errors, any, any uh, randomness. Basically, no, the answer is because the answers settle into an uh, interference pattern. And, and you, you query that, and that's what gives you the answer. Correct. And the other answer to that <laughs> is it depends on how the wave function collapses. Now, in in quantum technology, there is randomness in the collapse, and they get around it by massive parallelism and redundancy. Mm -hmm. But in, in the brain, uh, we think it's different, and that's, that's the key point. It goes back to the idea of what exactly quantum superposition is. As I said, quantum computers use this idea of things being in two states at once without addressing the problem, well, how can things be in two states at once? Roger, Roger Penrose addressed that problem in his, in his books, and his answer was that a particle can be in two places at the same time because reality itself separates. The universe at its very, very fundamental level actually separates. Now there's a theory of, of quantum mechanics called the multiple worlds hypothesis, which states that every superposition is, is like Roger said, a separation in, in fundamental reality, but those separations branch off to form a new universe so that every superposition leads to a new universe. So a particle in this, plate, in this position here will branch off and form a new universe. And if it's here, we'll branch off and form a new universe. We have this infinity of, over, of universes, more or less in parallel. And a lot of people believe that because mathematically it works out and it solves a problem. But it seems a little wasteful to have all these universes around. Roger said these separations occur, but they're unstable. Okay, there's some intrinsic factor in the universe that makes these separations unstable so that after a specific time, they will collapse or reduce to one state or the other. And he was able to come up with a, a, a use the indeterminacy principle, one of the fundamental equations in quantum mechanics. It's a very simple equation. E equals H over T, where H is Planck's constant. E is the gravitational self-energy, the amount of superposition, the amount of mass separated from itself, the amount of, of separation of, of space-time geometry. 
and T is the time until collapse. Basically, they're inversely related. So a large separation would collapse very quickly. A small separation wouldn't collapse for a long time. These types of separations, unlike the randomness inherent in decoherence, would be influenced by intrinsic factors in space-time geometry itself. And this is Rogers' non-computable factor. And he suggested that, these fa that this non-computable factor, intrinsic features of the universe, were like platonic values that were embedded in the universe from the Big Bang, including mathematical truth, as well as other platonic values like ethics, aesthetic values, and so forth. Good, evil, if you will. You can carry it as far as you want. And we later added the idea that qualia, the fundamental components of experience, of consciousness, were also features or properties at this fundamental, of space fundamental level of space-time geometry. So that a superposition, a separation in space-time geometry, which if isolated long enough to reach its threshold for self-collapse, would choose one or the other and basically access and select a particular set of qualia, therefore giving rise to experience or consciousness. So Roger's idea was that this type of collapse due to an objective uh, factor, so he called it objective reduction, or OR, objective reduction, would be conscious. And if it conveyed information, would, would be like the consciousness we have. To go back, as I said, a small object in superposition wouldn't collapse for a long time. So a single electron, for example, if isolated in superposition, wouldn't collapse for 10 million years. Okay. And, and the, the E, the amount of superposition, would be very low. We think E is related to the intensity of the experience. So it wouldn't be, it, when it had that experience after 10 million years, it wouldn't be very exciting. It'd be kind of kind of bland. Something like Schrodinger's cat, which is one, a, a kilogram, say, because it's fairly large, would only last, would last a very short time, like 10 to the minus 37 seconds. So it would, we wouldn't even notice it was both dead and alive. It would, it would collapse so fast. So we tried to apply this to the brain and came up with a time t that related to functions in the brain, which are roughly hundreds of milliseconds, fractions of seconds. And we related that to microtubules and how much, mi how much microtubule protein must be in superposition, how much quantum computation must be going on. And based on the number of microtubules per neuron, it comes out roughly 100,000 to a million neurons for every conscious moment, like that, which could happen like roughly, every, roughly 40 times a second. So this goes back to Whitehead's idea that consciousness is a sequence of events, roughly 40 times a second, and that each event is actually a separation and collapse in fundamental space-time geometry, and that Whitehead's wider field of proto-conscious experience is fundamental space-time geometry. Well, Roger asked the question, what does it mean for a particle to be in superposition? Right. How can something be in two places at the same time? And the answer, he said, is that the underlying reality of the particle separates. The universe at its most basic level splits so that a particle over here and here is actually its underlying reality separating. Interestingly, well, there's a, an interpretation of quantum mechanics called the multiple worlds hypothesis, which says that every superposition branches off and forms a new universe. So a superposition, uh, a separation of particles one goes off and forms a new universe where the particles in one location and one in the other. So going back to Schrodinger's cat, there would be a universe with a cat dead and a universe with a cat alive. Okay. And that's actually a, a, an interpretation that many people ascribe to because mathematically it works and it gets around the problem of superposition. Roger kind of follows that up to a point. He says that superpositions are indeed separations in reality at the fundamental level. If you go downward in scale, if uh, and, and physicists do this, well below the size of atoms, okay? And, and an atom actually is mostly empty when you think about it. If, if the nucleus of an atom were, were the size of a basketball, the electrons would be circling around 20 miles away. Sure. Most of it's empty space. Right. And in a vacuum, of course, there's no atoms anyway. So most of the universe is, is empty. If you go downward in scale, below the scale of atoms, an atom is roughly 10 to the minus 8 centimeters. Okay. If you go 25 orders of magnitude smaller, on the way down, everything is smooth until eventually you hit a level where all of a sudden there's coarse, coarseness, irregularity, bumpiness, information. It's kind of like falling out of an airplane from 33,000 feet. You see the, the ocean and it looks smooth. Mm -hmm. But as you get close, you get 
you get very close. Or if you were in a boat on the ocean, a small boat, you'd be chopping up and down. Mm -hmm. There's ways, there's, there's coarseness, there's information. Okay. okay. Similarly, at the basement level of the universe, well, some people think that if you go down below that level, or that, that uh, at that level you fall into black holes, and there's these miniature black holes everywhere, and then you pop out somewhere else. So, okay. But that's, that's conjecture. Nobody knows, really. Okay. But we do know that at that level there's coarseness, there's granularity, and this level is described various ways. It can be described by, by string theory, it can be described as quantum foam, it can be described as quantum gravity, it can be described as spin networks. Probably the, the, the explanation that makes the most visual sense to me is, is that at that level, there's a kind of multi-dimensional or three-dimensional network spider web of spin, where the kind of the edge of each uh, of the web is pure spin, and that the universe ultimately is made of spin. You could say, well, what's spin? What's, what's that made of? And You know, at some point we have to say, well, that's irreducible. We just have to say it's just there. And similarly, we say, well, the proto-conscious experience is just there. It's part of the universe at that level. Question. Now, the screen says the experience that we have, this complex image that you have right now of me and me of you, or that the viewers have looking at their screen, that's, what, that's the answer. That's the solution to the quantum computations that occur in the brain. So it's much more than yes or no. But nonetheless, the question is, how do we get that? How is that the output of the quantum computation? Well, 40 hertz, uh, every 40 times a second is... is, is what happens in the brain, there's, there's this frequency that seems to correlate with consciousness. So it could be that 40 times a second we have a, a, a moment of consciousness. Okay. As the philosopher Whitehead said, occasions of experience. So every 25 milliseconds, 40 times a second, we have a frame of consciousness, another frame, another frame, another frame. Now consciousness seems continuous to us. We don't notice that we're not conscious in between because we're not conscious. Sure. And like a movie seems continuous <coughs> rather than being herky-jerky because, well, well, hang on a second, Greg, because <coughs> quantum theory makes certain predictions and out to like, I forget, 25 uh, decimal points that have been verified over and over and over again. Quantum theory is actually very, very precise. The indeterminacy comes in certain randomness inherent in, in quantum theory. Okay. But, but when it, the predictions that are made are very, very accurate. Now, the thing about consciousness and the collapse that we think occurs in consciousness, it's a different type of collapse than the randomness that we normally think of in terms of quantum indeterminacy. They, they are up to a point in that they're quantum computations, they're superpositions, and there's this interaction among qubits. The difference is how the collapse or reduction occurs. In a quantum computer, the, the, the computation goes along and finishes, and then somebody opens the door and looks at it. Okay, And there's some randomness introduced, but because you've done it in parallel, that, that doesn't matter and you get the solution. Whereas in consciousness, it's a self-collapse. The superposition goes on until it reaches this threshold from, and it's of objective reduction, an objective threshold. And that objective threshold for self-collapse is due to the fact that it's, a, it's an actual separation in fundamental space-time geometry, as Roger predicted, and there's an instability there. So if you have a separation in the fundamental level, at, that are the Planck scale that I was talking about before, there's some resiliency there. It's kind of like being in a bubble bath. You know how the little bubbles pop mm -hmm. because they can only last so long? So you have these separations and they collapse. And when they do that, those are not random. Oh, it's yeah, it's not this, yeah, whether it's the surrounding bubbles or, or it's its own intrinsic uh, instability. Right. Right, but, but I think the opposite in that, in, in this case, the larger the bubble, the faster it's going to collapse. The smaller the bubble can go on for a long time. Maybe that happens. It depends on the amount of separation. And it depends on how, how far apart Right. Well, it depends how you look at, at, at separation. For example, let's say we're talking about a protein, a microtubule subunit separating from itself, okay, as the qubit, as the quantum bit. Okay. Is that the protein separating from itself? Is it the amino acids in that protein separating from themselves? Is it the atoms in that uh, protein separating? Is it the uh, protons, neutrons, electrons? Is it the atomic nucleus? Gotcha. You can look at it very... When the map to in Nancy's uh, work, she showed that when the ner certain neurons are activated, the MAP twos that normally connect the microtubules from the membrane detach. The microtubules go into isolation, therefore they go into a quantum state. From they the don't have the environment uh, causing uh, decoherence, so they are allowed to go into a quantum superposition, and they go on until they reach this threshold for collapse. They have their conscious moment, and then they reconnect to communicate the results to the outside world. But there are also maps okay. in between the microtubules that, that act to tune the quantum oscillations, kind of like frets on a guitar or, or some kind of musical instrument, mm -hmm. which is why we call them orchestr 
orchestrators. They orchestrate the quantum oscillations. So, and Connected they act kind of like frets on a guitar or, uh, so in a, or the corresponding uh, device in a, in a piano or a musical instrument to tune the quantum oscillations so that the quantum, quantum uh, computations can have some resonance in this bundle of microtubules. So that provides feedback also. The problem with quantum computing is that you need to be isolated in the, from the outside world, but you also need to have input and output. We think this happens by alternating phases of input-output, like roughly 25, uh, 25 milliseconds, 40 times a second. So you have a phase of communication, input-output. In the classical world, and then you have, and then the maps detach. You have buildup of the quantum computation in the microtubules, collapse, a moment of consciousness. You communicate the results, more input, then you initiate the quantum. So you repeat the cycle of classical quantum, classical quantum having a conscious moment, and then communicate the results, input into the quantum system, build up the quantum, over and over and over again, 20, 40 times a second. No, 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 that's the same as 40 here. 25 milliseconds is times 40 is one second. Okay. So when I say 25 milliseconds, I'm talking about the phase of the quantum computation building up and then collapsing. But the quantum oscillations themselves are much, much faster, 10 to the 13 hertz or something. In, in the quantum state, in the quantum when phase. When it's in the quantum phase. Right, and it's communicating non-locally with all the other quantum bits in the microtubules, and that neuron and other neurons connected through gap junctions, and presumably throughout, throughout the brain, uh, so that you can have this uh, fairly large number of tubulins involved so that it can reach threshold fairly quickly. Well, axons and dendrites uh, are, are noisy. So you have the problem of, therm of decoherence and thermal noise. If you try to get, it could be that, but I think if, if you try to get the quantum coherence to jump from one neuron to another across the synapse, you'd have to interact with the environment, the synapse being, a, being the uh, part but of the... Well, we think it's through a different type of synapse called a gap junction. A gap junction is uh, kind of a window between cells, where actually the inside of one is literally connected to the inside of another. It's like opening a door. So a neuron connected to another neuron by a gap junction, this window or porthole, is really one, one big room. Or better yet, you just open the glass and it's one room. So that, therefore, a quantum state would actually spread from one. Basically, you want one inside and one outside. So if you con connect a bunch of neurons by these gap junctions into sort of a hyperneuron, you could have a complex of neurons that basically have one inside and one outside. And inside that hyperneuron is where the quantum state can develop fairly quickly because you have enough enough microtubules, enough tubulin in superposition to reach threshold quickly because you need a fairly large amount to reach it quickly, otherwise it would take a long time and then you'd have decoherence problems. Plus you want it to happen fairly quickly so you can have the advantage of using it in, in, in real time and, and to, to, to do things that we need to do. Right. To As communicate well. the results to the outside world and con to communicate the outside world, gap junctions. Well, for the quantum state, we need gap junctions. Gap junctions are different, are different type of synapse for classical processing because not everything the brain does is conscious. In fact, well, the microtubes may be involved in, in a lot of things, but only, I mean, consciousness is kind of like the tip of an iceberg, okay? Most of what the brain do, does is non-conscious. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you anesthetize patients and look at their EEG, there's a lot of electrical activity going on when consciousness isn't there. So most of what the brain does is non-conscious, uh, then there's the issue of subconscious or preconscious, and consciousness is just kind of this, this tip of tip of an iceberg. So there's prob probably at any one time there's only let's say a million neurons out of 10 billion involved in uh, that are involved in consciousness. But those particular million might shift around depending on the connections of the gap junctions. Right. So we need the the synapses uh, and and axon dendrites classical processing to number one bring the environment you know from our senses into into the system. And number two, to communicate the results of the quantum computation conscious moments to the outside world. So if we make a conscious decision to do something, the results of that are communicated, and we think most of this is happening in the dendrites, to the axon hillock to cause the axon to fire, mm -hmm. which eventually tells our, our muscles to move or for us to do things. Right. So we need all this classical processing. Um, to support the, the, the quantum computations that are important for consciousness. And they also need that same type of classical information to bring the information to it. I mean, There's only one universe, okay? The fundamental level is the universe. Yeah, it's way, way down there, but it's everywhere, wherever you go. And basically, uh, Einstein equated uh, mass and curvature in space-time. So that a mass causes curvature in space-time, and you can also look at it the other way around. The curvature is mass in space-time. So really, space-time geometry Th at this fundam fundamental level is all there is. And spin, mass, charge, consciousness, everything derives from that. Mm -hmm. So an atom is, you know, you could think of it as, as just a dense 
curvature of space-time geometry. Mm -hmm. And at that fundamental level, okay, mass is one output of it, but also embedded at that level is information. For example, uh, the proto-conscious experience that philosophers call qualia, maybe things like redness or, or sadness or, you know, very simple. It's kind of like, you know, a painter has a palette with fundamental colors on okay. it, okay? And he or she takes a brush and picks a little of that and puts it here, a little of that, puts it there, and makes the Mona Lisa, okay, right. from these fundamental components. The fundamental components of our conscious experience, qualia, if you will, or proto-conscious qualia, are embedded at the fundamental level of the universe at the Planck scale. Or I mean, maybe you only have red-blue there, and, and the rest is done at, at a higher level. Or maybe it's even more fundamental than that. Maybe, re maybe color isn't even a good example because it's a specific wavelength of light. Mm -hmm. But something that makes up our experience is down at that level. When you put it all together, together gives us this, you know, feelings, qualia, if you will. When you put it all together, gives us the, the complex experience that we have. So our conscious experience, each frame, 40 times a second, is kind of like the Mona Lisa. Of course, it's changing due to the inputs and due to our, our conscious processes, quantum computations and microtubules, if we're correct, selecting particular sets of qualia at this fundamental level. So basically, yes, you are. Yes, you are. But, but uh, mm -hmm. you are the process, actually. It's not you making it. It's, it's you're actually self-assembling those proto-conscious qualia and putting them together to make, to make the frame. Design. Well, not one microtube. You need this whole, the, this whole collapse is conscious. It's a process of fundamental space-time geometry. It, well, it's kind, of a, right? it's kind of an all-or-none phenomenon in that objective because of this threshold phenomenon. You only have collapse when you, meet, when you reach threshold. If you, okay. if you decohere before, that's not conscious. You have to reach this threshold. Only if, it, threshold. only if it was isolated for years. You need, you need uh, you know, billions. <laughs> or you need, uh, actually, I can tell you how many you need. For uh, roughly, we calculated for a uh, 40 hertz, you need something like uh, 10 to the 10th tubulins, uh, tubulins being the protein subunits of microtubules. So that's uh, a billion, 10 billion tubulins per conscious event. It would, have to be, it would have to be isolated for years, for just one. But if you put them all together, you reach, you know, you, you increase the E, you increase the amount of superposition, so you reach threshold fairly quickly, so you can reach it within 25 milliseconds. If you left one tubulin by itself, it would take, you know, uh, 10 years or something like that, and then it would be a very low intensity experience, because the E is also related to the intensity of the experience. So, for example, if you're excited, if, if somebody scares you or, or enchants you or something like that, mm -hmm. the quantum superposition builds up more quickly, okay? Marshall's more Lord. inputs, more inputs, and uh, you just reach, th it just, you get excited and you reach threshold more quickly, so that the height, of, and then you reach collapse, and then you do it again and again. So two things happen. The, the intensity is greater, and you have more events per time. So you have more intense experience, and they're happening more frequently. And in fact, plus you're having more events per time, which means that your inner time is faster and the outer world is slower. Well, technological quantum computers have a clock time, but in, but, and, and the microtubules within, within those conscious events may have the same, you know, fast 10 to the 13th, uh, second per second clock time, but they're going to reach threshold quicker. So the the conscious events are going to be more intense and happen more often. How, how yes, al although dreaming may also occur. I think dreaming in the subconscious is quantum superposition. In fact, in, in this model, before collapse, what do you have? You have quantum superposition. That's the preconscious, which may be the subconscious. Okay, okay. The Freudian subconscious or the dream state or something like that. And, for example, dreaming is very much, in some ways, like quantum superposition. You have multiple possibilities coexisting, you have deep, deep connections, you have distortions of reality, you have t time, funny things with time, you have all things that are very... And, in fact, if you look at paintings that, that, that certain artists do that seem to come from the subconscious, you have the same sort of uh, surreal, uh, subconscious, uh, dreamlike qualities that are similar, I think, anyway, to quantum superposition of, of distorted reality, multiple possibilities, interconnectedness, and so forth. So maybe the, the, the subconscious or the preconscious is really in quantum superposition. And when it reaches collapse, you have a conscious moment. But you can also su get you know, elements of the subconscious out non-consciously in various ways. I had some very powerful, intense, introspective experiences when I was younger that made me really wonder what was going on, what I was and what I was doing here and what everything was. And when I found myself in medical school, I was studying uh, cell division under the microscope, and I saw these microtubules pulling chromosomes apart, and I wondered how they knew what to do. And I got this idea that the same, whatever was in my consciousness was also occurring down there. And at that time, it was discovered that these same structures were also found in neurons, because prior to that, the fixative agent in 
electron microscopy had been dissolving them for many, many years. So when I, I discovered that these structures were in all cells, including neurons, I began to think that they were important for consciousness. And, but I was driven by, by my own uh, personal uh, intense curiosity from uh, my experiences earlier. <clears throat> my conclusion after all this is that consciousness is a self-organizing process at this fundamental level of the universe, that we are really the universe. We're a process occurring at this basic level. So we're connected to the universe and we're also connected to each other because the universe has this property of non-locality. Everything's connected to everything. So it's kind of a spiritual thing because basically we are a fundamental level of the universe. And at that level, there's all kinds of information, wisdom, if you will. Uh, the Buddhist universal mind, the Jungian collective unconscious, uh, platonic values, um, uh, things in the Kabbalah about wisdom and light. Uh, various religions and spiritual quests all have this idea of some greater universal truth, wisdom, connectedness, spirituality, call it God, call, call it what you will, that's part of the universe. And I think that this, the physics of it take us down to this fundamental level. And Penrose's work uh, describes how this information can be there. And taken with quantum physics tells us how we can be connected to this level and how we can be connected to the universe and to each other and that the universe is in some sense alive and in some sense proto-conscious really and has been probably since the Big Bang. Well, I kind of kept to my, uh, my quest uh, because I was in a, uh, in a field, anesthesiology, which allowed me to study consciousness. And, uh, you know, I'm a clinical anesthesiologist, so every day I put my patients to sleep and I still wonder, you know, where do they go? Okay. And that makes me wonder why are they there in the first place and what consciousness really is. And when they wake up and they're talking to me, it's, you know, even though it's routine, it's also still marvelous. And I think, uh, actually, anesthesia is one of the great inventions of the last thousand years, when you think about it. And what anesthetics do, what the gases do anyway, is get into the brain and work by very delicate quantum mechanical forces, suggesting that consciousness itself is a quantum, quantum process. So that allowed me to study this while pursuing an academic career and earning a living as, a, as an anesthesiologist. So I was fortunate in that. And plus the fact that in doing it this way, I didn't have to follow traditional paths. I didn't have to be cubbyholed so I could get grants, so I could be in any discipline, so I could get approval from people by, by doing the predictable type of thing. I could be a maverick and follow what intuitively mm -hmm. I thought was the right thing. And I'm very fortunate for that. Academic freedom is a great thing, and it's allowed me to, to come to this point. And, uh, you know, I, I get criticized a lot because it's a radical idea. I'm a maverick. Uh, Roger's a maverick. But, you know, I think it's far greater to be criticized than ignored. And the fact that, that we annoy people who have conventional approaches is, is, is actually kind of cool. The, uh, there have been several studies recently about near-death experiences in, in Europe, and uh, those descriptions are very uh, re repetitive. P patients People do say, say the that. same. And they also at least occasionally say that they float out of their body and mm -hmm. can, can describe things from above and may flow out, float out to the waiting room and have a sense of calm, and they may visit uh, you know, their, their deceased relatives and this sort of thing. And uh, my explanation for that is that consciousness is actually a process in fundamental space-time geometry, okay? It's at the very, very basic level of the universe. Now, normally, it's in the space-time geometry, you know, between our ears, mm -hmm. in the microtubules in our neurons. But when the, they stop working, when the metabolic drive, the blood flow, the oxygen the, uh, is, is stopped and the acid builds up and the coherent pumping of the microtubules driving the quantum coherence stops, the quantum information isn't lost. It just kind of leaks out to the universe at large in space-time geometry. It's still there. Well, the near-death experience is curious for several reasons because uh, patients report uh, awareness that seems to be occurring when their brain's not working. Right. And clinically, uh, doctors would say it's impossible because you know the brain's not functioning. They can't they can't be having awareness at that time. Well, I think it proves that, but you know, skeptics come up with different types of explanations. But what I think happens, as I said, is that the quantum information leaks out into the uh, space-time geometry at large. You may think that it's going to dissipate and spread out and be lost. But because of quantum entanglement, it, it tends to stay together, at least for a while, and can sort of hover. And when the body, uh, you know, when the patient is resuscitated and the blood flow is resumed, and if too much damage hasn't been done, it resumes, uh, returns to, to the brain. And uh, which raises the question of what happens if the patient does not, is not revived? Does that, is that the soul? Does it go off indefinitely into the universe? And maybe it does. <coughs> a sense of calm, a sense of uh, that everything is okay and they're not frightened. And, uh, which, and when people try to explain this by delusions due to lack of oxygen, it, 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 that doesn't jive because when patients 
are short of oxygen, they get confused, confused and agitated. And these patients have just the opposite reaction. They're very serene and calm. And when they come back, they're, they say it was actually, it, it wasn't uh, scary at all. It was it, most of the time, not all the time, that it was very uh, calm and, and reassuring. I mean, right, no but I mean, if, if patients get hypoxic, that is suffer lack of oxygen, okay. before, the, you know, while they're still there, they're confused and agitated. Okay. So there's some people who try to explain these near-death experiences by saying, well, lack of oxygen causes this hallucination of sense of calmness, but that doesn't really uh, fit. B besides which, they describe things that occur when they are gone, and in some cases, uh, uh, things that they couldn't have, have known otherwise. In some cases, things that occur out in the waiting room. So there's a lot of very, at least anecdotal, bizarre things that can't be explained by conventional explanations. And I think, you know, there's a reasonable possibility that it's, that, that consciousness being a process in fundamental space-time geometry, I know I keep saying that like a broken record, but, but that's the universe, that's, that's where we live, that's all there is, really. And that consciousness is a self-organizing process at that level, and it goes out to the universe at large, but yet hangs together somehow because of this quantum entanglement. So it gives the possibility that there is a soul or a spirit after death. Well, maybe that's what happen, happens to us. That's where we go when, 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 when we When that die. occurs. Quantum information. Yeah, yeah. Quantum. In fact, you know, the Kabbalah is another approach to this. And the Kabbalah, uh, Jewish mysticism, if you will, says that we live in a world of one, the 1% world of, of uh, aggravation, basically. Things are kind of uh, rough, frictionful, as you said. And on the other side, and then there's a curtain on the other side, there's wisdom and light and mm -hmm. enlightenment. And there's a curtain in between and, and consciousness occurs, actually dances on the edge between the 1% world of aggravation, I call it, and the 99% world of wisdom and light. You might say, well, if the quantum world, the quantum world is very small, yet how can it be the 99% world? If you go down in scale, you're getting smaller, but the amount of information is vast. If you go down to these quantum gravity level of spin networks, for example, to the actual pixels of consciousness, or pixels of the universe, uh, there's something like 10 to the 107th in, our, in the volume of our brain. So the amount of information is, is so vast, it's just mind-boggling. So the 99% world could indeed be this small quantum world, but it's everywhere, so it's really, really vast. And maybe that's where we go, you know, to get to the other side. I mean, if you believe in uh, reincarnation and so forth, that's quite possible that those things happen. I mean, I don't know. I mean, why not? I mean, but it, it could be, I think biology actually uh, evolved and developed to house and access consciousness and to, to take it from maybe this, uh, you know, sort of distributed non-local uh, form into concentrated form for a while and then we go back there and you know my a friend of mine uh, Paula Zizi is a an astrophysicist in Italy and she she has this theory uh, right after the Big Bang the universe underwent this very very rapid inflation uh, like in a, in a tiny fraction of a second it, it just expanded very very fast and then it reached this threshold and then since then it's been expanding very very slowly this is called period of inflation and she she has theorized that this end of inflation, the reason that the inflation stopped and the uh, expansion has been very, very slow, was that this, that before that, everything was in superposition. There were multiple universes, e tiny universes, but expanding very rapidly. And at that moment, uh, the Penrose objective reduction was met and the multiple worlds collapsed to one. And since then, it's been expanding fairly slowly. No, 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 it reduced from multiple possibilities to one. One universe was chosen. Okay. And by Penrose definition, that is a conscious moment. So she says that at that moment, shortly after the Big Bang, the universe had a cosmic conscious experience, maybe, or, it, uh, or at least proto-conscious, because I think that at this fundamental level, at least a anything in superposition has the potential to be conscious. It may not have a lot of information, so it may not be conscious in the sense that, w that, that we're conscious, but potentially at least there could be some kind of pure consciousness with or without information. She called, by the way, her, her theory is called uh, the Big Wow, because at this moment the universe had this cosmic conscious experience right after the Big Bang. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. I mean, who knows? Nobody, kn nobody knows for sure. But, but the other thing about this is that, uh, you know, this funny thing about time going backwards. So, you know, we can always maybe go backwards in time. Who knows?